Open your copy of God's Word, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 52. This was my assigned text for the month. Uh, The other pastors got together and decided we should preach through Isaiah and that I should preach through this, okay? So here I am, and I'm excited. I haven't had an assigned text in a while. But uh, Isaiah 52, verse 11, hear God's word. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. I want you to see in that text, suffering precedes satisfaction. Out of the anguish of his soul, that's the suffering of Christ. He sees it, sees what God is accomplishing and is satisfied. We have a um, celebration we do every year in this country It is the commemoration of signing the Declaration of Independence, 1776 uh, Declaration of Independence. And we send our kids to school to to know that date, to uh, commemorate uh, the founding of this country as a free nation. And the reason we want to stop and focus on it and commemorate it and remember it is because preceding that date was suffering. We don't have the freedoms in America that we enjoy without the suffering of our forefathers. Those who suffered, those who went to war, those who gave their lives for us to have the freedoms we enjoy. We need to constantly remember satisfaction, the satisfactions we have to even enjoy the freedoms of Christmas we have because someone has suffered before us and blessed us with the life we now have. Spiritually, we enjoy spiritual freedoms because Christ has suffered. Spiritual freedoms like I get to communicate with my creator, God, because of the sufferings of Christ. I have a secure reservation to dine with Jesus and live eternally in mansions because Christ suffered. And we want to take the time each year to remember The birth of Christ, yes, but the birth was so that he could live a life of suffering. And in suffering for us, could bless us, could birth us into a life with him for all eternity. And seeing that, he is a God who is satisfied. It's... Sometimes difficult and to think of, to remember, and to do. Celebrate the pain of another. But our celebration of Christ is the celebration of his pain, the pain of another. And he even did it himself. It says, out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. He sees it. He rejoices in it. He celebrates it. The, uh, back in Isaiah 53, 11, the, the word anguish is, is a word, you may have a translation that just calls it labor or may call it toilsome labor. It's, it's, it's the word that best describes a mother giving birth to a child. When she gets to that moment, she's about to give birth, we say she's in labor. She is at a moment of great pain. She's not walking, moving, but it's a white knuckle moment. She's stressed. She's straining. Her face is turning red. Her knuckles are turning white. She's about to birth a human being into the world, and it comes through great travail, toilsome labor, much 
anguish. And Christ chooses that description to describe what he was going through. I had a mother once said, I hope my husband gets kidney stones. I said, what? Why? He said, I want him to feel at least a taste of what I had to go through to birth his son. You know, it's painful. And you don't want to do it alone. It's, it's, it's travailing. It's, it's unimaginable. And it's hard to get a taste of it if you haven't had it or experienced it. It seems unimaginable that it would be that bad, that it could possibly be unbearable. What I want us to get a feeling of what Christ went through as he says he sees his anguish, his travail. Look at uh, two texts, Matthew 26. We'll start there. Matthew 26. Beginning at verse 36. Let's hear this paragraph. <clears throat> then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And <clears throat> taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. You know, it's hard to imagine sorrow just overcoming you to the point that you say, it's about to kill me. The stress is mounting up. We just sang a song how every sin on him was laid. As you imagine sin after sin coming on to the shoulders of Christ. It was being laid upon him as he was becoming sorrowful. That he was to take the sin of the world upon himself. Uh, and it's interesting, he says to... Uh, Peter, James, and John, remain here. Watch with me. Watch. Jesus has never needed fellowship. He's always had the Father of the Spirit. It's not a need of His, and yet He asked them to watch with Him. Uh, if ever Jesus needed someone to give Him a hug, to be with Him, to go through something with Him, it was now. Taking the weight of the sin of the world upon himself. This is about to make me collapse. Watch with me. Be here with me. Help sustain me. Verse 39, going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible... Let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples. He found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sin is coming upon Christ. In his thoughts, his manner, he's feeling the, the weight of our sin. And he thinks about Peter and James and John and says, y'all are missing the power of sin that's at war with me. You need to be careful that you don't fall into sin here. And the temptation is strong. And Christ says it is so unimaginably unbearable. I wish it could go, but it's not my will. It's God's will. I have come to do His will. Now, let's look at the parallel account. There's a few other things 
that we pick up. Look at Luke chapter 22. Beginning at verse 39. And he came out and he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to a place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And there appeared, guess this, there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Does that not seem odd? Who needs to strengthen Jesus? He's been declared in Isaiah as the mighty God. And yet he needs at this moment. The anguish is so severe. He needs to be strengthened. My understanding of that is the reason for it is because he has laid aside his divinity to take on human flesh. And human flesh just can't take it. It's too much. The flesh he has chosen for his body to be the sacrifice for you and me is a body that cannot bear up under the load of my sin. The wrath of God due me, due to you, is such a huge amount that he can't bear it. And so an angel comes to strengthen him, prop him up in that moment to be able to endure your sin and mine. That's the travail. That's the labor. That's the anguish that Christ was looking at and finding satisfaction in. Of Have you... Illustrate it differently. Have you ever taken a walk that was so far that you got blisters on your feet? Why? Because you're a sissy, you tender foot. <laughs> happens to me every year. I go to the beach and I want to do that long romantic walk with my wife down the beach. So we go about two miles one way. And two miles back. And by the time I've reached two miles, I got blisters on my feet. And I got to come back. And I'm just, ah, 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 ah. Why? Because I haven't had, my feet have been covered up all year long. They have had no substance to toughen them up. They're tender feet. Imagine A human body that has never known sin. That has never had anything to toughen it up against the wrath of God. And you imagine Christ who knew no sin. He was tender. He was the lily of the valley. He was the rose of Sharon. He was the spotless lamb of God. And he took the sin of the world. He suffered like no other in taking that sin for you and for me. It was so unbearable that even mighty God required strengthening. Remember he prayed, Lord, this is too much, it's too much, let it pass, let it pass. Good thing we had a plan. Good thing the Father 
And the Son and the Spirit had a plan, and that's for him to endure and to go through it. Because it was that kind of anguish that you wanted to scream. I read to you earlier in the service, Hebrews 5, 7. Now perhaps you could get a sense of what's going on here. Hebrews 5, verse 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and with tears. Can you imagine a stone's throw? I guess I could throw one to the end of the wall there. So I'm here, Jesus is there. He says, you stay here, I'll go there, and I'm going to pray. So it's not like it's a long distance. But you hear him, God! It's too much! Not my will. And then you begin to hear weeping for the sins that have come on us are now coming on him. And he's crying out to the one who can save. God the Father, who is saving him from that moment of total exasperation. Uh, I guess, I think, the point is as we go into Christmas, we think of what Christ is birthed into. We need to have a thought or two, a moment, a celebration of his pain. Because it was a painful life he lived for you and me. As he rose from that garden and he's arrested from that spot. He gives his face to spit. He gives his hands and his feet to spikes. He gives his heart to spear. And he dies for you and for me. That we might be forgiven. That all the wrath that we should receive came upon him. And he pays for our offenses that we could go free. That's the suffering of Christ. If you're playing with sin, if you're playing with your freedoms, it's because you're not given enough thought to the fact that Christ suffered. He suffered for what you're playing with. And we need to be done with sin and living in his righteousness. Let us stop and celebrate his pain that frees us and be done with any fashion of playing with sin like it doesn't matter. Because it did matter. It does matter. It matters greatly. Go back to Isaiah 53, verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. The effects Christ has, uh, the, the effect of the suffering on Christ was satisfaction. There's another place this is mentioned. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Therefore, since, I'm going to start at verse 1. Therefore, since we have, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He had joy out in front of him. For the joy set before him, he endured it. He endured the pain. 
He endured the cross. He endured the anguish of soul. He endured all manner of suffering to the level that an angel would have to strengthen. He endured it. He endured the loud cries, the screams, the tears. Because there was joy. There was, there was a, he knew the end of this road is I'm going to be able to look back and be happy. I'm going to be satisfied with the anguish of my soul. He celebrated it. This is why I think we should develop some sense of his suffering and pain and respond to it as he did. So, so happy that he went through that. He endured the cross. He despised, went through the despising, the shame, um, that he did all of that for you and for me. Um, pain was worth it. Uh, we've all had, I think, some sort of experience where we, we just, we're not going to be satisfied. Um, I remember uh, once, I, I lose it from time to time. This is once I lost it. Um, and uh, I was in an airport out LAX. Um, I just finished an intensive two weeks of class. Um, and had so I had not been here and I had been missing my kids, been missing my wife. And I got to the, got on the airplane, pilot comes over the speaker and says, uh, everybody's going to have to get off the airplane. We've got some sort of mechanical difficulty and uh, we're not going to be able to take off today. And, you know, we're all saying, well, what does that mean? And by the time I got to the counter, what does that mean? And the lady there said, well, it means that you don't get to go home today. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not an option. You know, you don't understand. I've got plans. i got to see my wife. i got to see my kids. i got to get home. She said, I'm sorry, we don't have any flights going out of this desk. I said, which desk does? You know, and I started running down this airport to every single desk. Who has a flight going to Greenville, South Carolina? That's where I'm going. You know, you've got to get me on that. And it's, you know, it's already 8 or 9 o'clock at night. I know they're limited. Uh, they're not going to do this all night long. And I'm just running, 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 running. Why? Because I wasn't satisfied. And you've probably had some sort of experience like that too. And that's where Christ was. I, I'm going to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this until I am satisfied. I will be satisfied with my suffering. And Christ looked at his suffering, his anguish, and he endured it, he says. He ran the race to the end. He endured until he was satisfied. Christ was satisfied with his sufferings. Christ was pleased. Uh, how could he be pleased? Um, verse 10 of Isaiah 52 says, It was the will of the Lord to crush him, to put him to grief, so his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. And he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The hope in that verse is, yes, God's going to crush him. Yes, everything's going to get miserable. But he's going to see offspring. He's going to see his offspring. He's going to travail to the point of giving birth. Christ is going to birth literally strain and agonize to push his church into existence. To birth a people with his righteousness, with no guilt, with his record, being freed from the guilt of sin and the punishment of sin. He sees his offspring. I think that's where Christ is pleased share with you a story I heard from uh, James Kennedy before he passed. He was preaching at the 17th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in America, and he shared this story. There it was, 
there is, I guess it still is, uh, a drawbridge on a Midwestern um, river that carries a train across. So the train track goes up and down as the train needs to cross. Most tra trains, you know, don't cross but once a day or twice a day. It's not a big job. Put the drawbridge down uh, so the train can cross. But you can't put it down and crush boats that are under it. It was that low. So you've got to look for the boats. You've got to have it all timed out and send the tracks down. Well, this man was proud of his job. He liked doing it. And uh, one day he decided, yeah, I never brought my son to work. He had an eight-year-old boy. He said, I'm going to bring my son to work. And he sat up in the booth and talked about the different kinds of boats that were floating by. Um, and uh, making sure everything was right. About 12 o'clock, he said, you know, why don't we take our lunch and we'll go down to the dock below and let's just eat there and watch the boats uh, go by. So he's down on the docks. They've opened their lunch bag and they're eating their lunch. And he hears a chain, train whistle. And so he looks at his watch. Oh, it's a 1230 train. I got to get back up drop the tracks so <clears throat> he told his son you just wait right here you watch the train come by I gotta daddy's gotta go put the tracks down so he's climbing up back up into his booth and he's just got seconds at this point you know to start sending this track down so the train can come through or the train will run into the river it has no recourse back in those days to, to know that it's not ready for him and he looks down, he's fixing to push the lever to drop the, the tracks. When he looks down and sees that his son has started climbing up. And his son fell into the cogs of the wheel that lowers the tracks. He says that if I push the lever any further, the cogs will cut my son in half. He had seconds to make a decision. What is he going to do? He knew there was a train full of people that were heading to their death if he didn't push that lever. He pushed the lever down. And he looked as the train flew by. There were a couple ladies having tea. There's a man reading a paper. There's a couple of boys playing a game. Somebody else just having a drink. Nobody looked his way. Nobody seemed to care. Nobody knew what he had done. But a father gave his son that they might live. And we have a God who chose to crush his son. And you and I might look back sometimes with indifference and with no gratitude for the pain, for the anguish that would cause. And yet it's the only way we were saved. And set free. Out of the anguish of his soul. He saw people. Like you and me. Who didn't even know what he was doing. And he says I'm satisfied. Because I'm going to make you mine. I'm going to free you of sin. It's guilt and it's pain. Now where does that lead, lead us. When we go into the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a time where bread has been broken, his body for you, and wine has been poured, his blood given for you. It's always a remembrance of God crushing his son, destroying a body and flesh, pouring out the blood that others 
could go free. We need to learn to look at that pain and have the appropriate response of gratitude and thankfulness, celebration of Christ. He was satisfied. We need to be satisfied. When I was in seminary, Jackson, Mississippi, Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, we had a blizzard. Jackson, Mississippi does not have blizzards. Might have been the only one on record as far as I know. So they're not prepared for that. I was, Patty and I, we were a one-car family, so she had dropped me off at work. I worked at a ceramic shop at this time as a mold caster. And so we heard on the radio that, well, we could see outside the windows that it was snowing. But it was coming harsh. It was fast. It was fierce. It was sleet all in it. And the announcers were saying, you got to get home wherever you are. Well, I didn't have a ride home, and it's already gotten so bad, my wife couldn't come to me. I had to somehow go to her, so I asked the only other person in the shop, the owner, I said, can you drop me off? He said, well, I'm not going that way. I can go as far as this way. I said, take me that far. And so where he had to drop me off, you know, it's, it was not too bad. It was down about where Chick-fil-A is, and I had to walk up a sidewalk uphill like to Amed North. So that's my distance, but it's a blizzard. At the time, I had a full beard, snow and ice was hitting it. By the time I got home, I had two-inch ice tags, you know, all the way around. I looked like the abominable, you know, coming in. And when I walked through the door, my wife was there with my favorite food, barbecue and rice. It was her dad's homemade barbecue, her homemade rice. I can still taste it. Nothing beats it. I can't have it again. He doesn't make it anymore. But there it was. And I thought, I just suffered for this. I was earning money to produce this. If I could do it over, I think I would just soon not have bought it. Not have suffered. But now, I'm satisfied happy and there's a sense of that in in each of these meals that someone has suffered someone has purchased us with blood and he dines with us and says and I'm satisfied as Christ takes this with us his own body and blood and says I'm satisfied let us find our satisfaction Holy in Christ, who has given so much for us. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before your table, we see before us Christ, our Savior, who was crushed in body, who was in anguish of soul whose blood was spilt. Let us see him and not find it to be a ritual, but find it to be an intimate communion with a God who cries for us and weeps for us, who prays for us, who washes us with his blood, who nourishes us through the anguish of his soul. Father, may we grow in more and more celebration of the depth of your love and your grace and your mercy. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.